Well, good morning. Welcome to the 2016 Mayberry Lecture. My name is Kurt Ryman. I'm the Mayberry Chairholder here at Tennessee Tech. Today I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Don Leiter, our featured speaker for today. Uh, Don uh, is currently Director of the Institute for Healthcare uh, Quality Research and Education and uh, a, a, a professor of physics. Of no, not physicians, physicians executive <laughs> MBA program at the at, uh, University of Tennessee. Uh, he holds uh, undergraduate and MBA degrees from uh, the University of Illinois and a medical degree from St. Louis University. He has a very, very diverse background in healthcare, healthcare management, healthcare quality, uh, particularly in the revolution in, in uh, improvement in, in medical services and medical quality over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. So without further ado, I'll introduce, uh, uh, let uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Leiter take over this uh, presentation, and hopefully the technology will uh, do some backfilling for us. But uh, first, let me uh, introduce Dr. Leiter. The computer's not working, the microphone's not working, but we're going to do this anyway. So we'll do that. This kind of reminds me, I, I was telling folks up here, we did a, I'm a pediatrician. <coughs> so I know all of you people. And we did a medical mission to Brazil. This was about 10, 12 years ago now. And we each took a big bin of medicine and medical supplies, things like that. Walked into Brazil, walked into customs, the customs agents looked at all that stuff and literally confiscated it all. You know, who are all these, who are these 32 people showing up at our border with drugs and medical supplies? And we basically did the entire medical mission without any medicine. So I'm gonna do this entire thing without slides. We'll see how this works, I don't know. But I think you'll have a copy, has anybody seen a copy of the slides by any chance? No, you haven't seen those, okay. I think my understanding is that you guys will have a copy of the slides and we're working right now on trying to get the projector to work. And if we do, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about here. Now, I use my slides as an outline, so I'm gonna be clicking away up here so that I don't forget to tell you something that I think is important. But the things I want you to, hopefully you'll, you'll come away with today is an appreciation of where we are in terms of healthcare both as an industry and in terms of the quality of care that we provide. How many of you have had experience with the healthcare system in the last year? How many of you are happy with your experience with the healthcare system in the last year? Anybody? Bueller? Bueller? Yeah, okay, so a few people are, but you'll notice that I don't get this resounding hello, everybody. I'm really happy that I'm in the healthcare delivery system here. I'm having a good time at my doctor's office, or I'm having a, a good experience at the hospital. Part of the problem that we see is that these systems have been set up, and we have for many, many years been provider-centric, which means that the systems kind of revolve around the physicians, around the uh, radiology departments, the pieces of the organization in a hospital that provide the care, but they aren't really revolving around patients. And I think that's one of the things that we're seeing as one of the major improvements in the healthcare system in the last few years. So we're just about ready to see some of these slides. We have uh, got some statistics to show you because I was told you guys are a business audience, so you want to see some statistics. So let's talk a little bit about how we compare internationally. And you'll see that we have this is everybody else in the world here, and this is us. So we're good, right? Well, actually, no. Because what that is, is that's the growth in health care expenditures as a percentage of gross domestic product. You guys all know what GDP is, gross domestic product. And health care has grown to about 17.5%. This was as of 2013. And it's actually higher than that now in, 24, in, in 2016. The data for 2014 is just come, becoming available, but it's up around 18% now. 
So 18% of every dollar that's spent in the United States is healthcare related. Is that a good thing? I mean, I think it's good. I, mean, I think it's bad. Yeah. Why is it bad? Why is it bad? Should we be spending money on our health? What would we be spending it on if we weren't spending it on our health? What? Anybody? A boat. A boat? <laughs> okay, a boat. A Ferrari. No, I'm not a Ferrari. I'm just a pediatrician, guys. You know, a Ford Escape is about the best idea. But we'd be spending it on other kinds of consumer goods that actually would help grow the economy. And so spending on healthcare is, is an investment. We have to make an investment in healthcare. But we're way far and above all the other industrialized countries in the world as to where we fit in expenditures for healthcare. This is how much we're spending both publicly and privately per capita. This was 2011. You notice we're number one again, but that's because we have such high expenditures for healthcare. Compared to a lot of other countries, the next is Norway, Switzerland, Netherlands, Austria, all countries that are similar to ours in many ways. But we're still far and away spending more money per capita than other countries throughout the world. This is pharmaceutical costs. This is another thing that we're really seeing a big hit for right now. And we're, again, the highest of all of these other countries. And we've maintained that rate of being the highest of all the countries for many years now. So the trend is not improving, it's actually getting a little bit worse. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to deal with all of these issues as, what, as what's going on right now in the United States. But let's see if all that extra money is actually buying us stuff that we want. So if you're born in 2011, those are the bars. If you're born in 1970, those are the, the uh, little diamonds. But if you're born in either one of those years, that's your life expectancy at birth. And this is compared over a number of different countries. <clears throat> and this is the median for all those countries right here. We're still below the median in terms of life expectancy. So we're spending about 40 to 50% more than other countries are throughout the world, but we haven't seen the change in life expectancy. What else? Cardiovascular mortality, things that you're going to die of when you get older, like me, like heart attacks, strokes, things like that. Where do we fit there? Well, this is the improvement slide. This is the improvement graph, but this is the incidence graph. And in 2011, we were still below the median in terms of heart attacks, strokes, and other things that kill people related to the heart. Babies that are born. You would think we'd be way down here at this end with a very low infant mortality rate. <coughs> but we're not. We're way up here. Not too far, really, from the top, but certainly in a place where for all the money we spend on that kind of care, we should be doing better. Now, I understand there might be some nursing students in here today. Here's, what I, here's how I'm going to tell. Field chromocytoma. How many people know what that is? Oh gosh, you're not a nursing student, you're a COO. <laughs> oh, you're a nurse, okay, so there you are. So we've got, so basically what we have to learn to do is listen to folks like our nursing folks, our nursing staff, as to finding ways of becoming more efficient and effective. We're gonna talk about how we do it. Medical errors. This is one of the things that's kind of scary, in my, in my opinion. We have, for many, many years, been trying to reduce medical errors. We're actually doing pretty well in some things. Things like adverse drug events. Those are the things where one drug reacts with another drug and causes you to get sicker instead of better. Or a drug is prescribed for you that probably isn't going to help and may make things worse and it makes you worse. Those things happen, overdoses, things like that. Don't worry too much about these things. These are certain kinds of infections that we particularly see in hospitals. 
that are related to some of the things that we do, like putting catheters and bladders and putting central lines in people to deliver uh, high volumes of fluids. Injuries from falls, obstetrical adverse events, problems with moms and babies when in, the, uh, neo, in the neonatal period. Pressure ulcers, bed sores. Anybody who's had an older person that can't move around much knows about pressure sores. Surgical site infections, venous thrombolump, with blood clots in the legs. Things like that are generally preventable. And we know ways of preventing them, but we're still seeing those things at incident, at incident rates that are too high. So those are the things that we really need to work on. Hospital errors are the third leading cause of death in the United States. And this, this was a study that came out of three or four years ago now, back in 2011. There's an organization called the Institute of Medicine that put out this uh, report back in 1999 called To Err is Human. It's quite, quite famous in medical circles. And back then, they said that about 100,000 people per year were dying because of medical errors, and hospitals were dying because of medical errors. Because of those, that list of things that I showed you before. There's a group called the LeapFrog Group. And for business students, this could be interesting. The LeapFrog Group is actually a group of major businesses that came together to try to put some pressure on the healthcare delivery system to improve the quality of care. And in fact, what ended up happening was they started creating measures. And they measure things, they measure a number of different things that we weren't measuring before. But their data now is showing that, well, that may be an underestimate. We may be seeing as many as 400,000 plus deaths per year from medical errors. Not a happy thing. Now, you think doctors and nurses and respiratory therapists and all these folks go to go to work every day and say, gosh, I can't wait to see what kind of error I can make today. That isn't the way it works. We all show up for work every day expecting the systems within which we work are going to work appropriately and are going to be safe both for our patients as well as for the people who are working in the system. But what we're seeing is we're not quite there yet. So, one of the reasons I thought I'd probably get a lot of people not happy about their health care is because we pay a lot for it. And as a country, you'll notice down here, this is the health insurance coverage by payer in 2011, which is just after the, health, the Affordable Care Act started. And you'll see that we still had a fairly low percentage of people who were privately insured. We had quite a few people who were publicly insured. We had a big gap, that little blank area at the end, is the gap of people who were uninsured. Now, what do we think about uninsured people? Gee, that's too bad. I'm sure sorry you don't have insurance. So you can't buy your medicine and can't see your doctor? Well, that's not just the half of it, actually. I'm glad you're here today because we can talk about when an uninsured patient gets in a car wreck goes to the emergency room. Then they get admitted to the hospital. They have to have surgery. Then they have to go to the intensive care unit for four or five weeks. Then they have to have rehab. Who pays for that? <coughs> well, they get a bill for four or five hundred thousand dollars. If you got a bill for four or five hundred thousand dollars, what would you do? You write a check. Right? I mean, that's what we all do. Or even better, put it on your credit card. Yeah. That doesn't happen. What ends up happening is those bills get tucked away in a drawer someplace. And then the hospital has to try to find some way, of, and the physicians and the other folks who are pr providing the care have to figure out a way to pay for it. They can't get paid. There's no way this individual is going to be able to afford a half million dollars just because he, wanted, he or she wanted to live. <clears throat> so what ends up happening is you and I pay for it. Because what hospitals do and what physicians do and what other providers do is they have to charge more to cover the cost of caring for those folks. So in essence, that money, that those costs get transferred to all of us 
because the insurance coverage isn't there. So that's one of the things that we have to work with, work for, because people can't afford the out-of-pocket cost of health care. This is from a study from uh, the Commonwealth Fund study, and this is a good source of data if you're ever in a position where you have to have data about health care. But if you look at this, this is the out-of-pocket medical cost in the past year, and this is the percentage of people who had to spend $1,000 or more. In the United States, about 41% of people had to uh, spend at least $1,000 or more for their health care. But you'll notice that's really the exception. Australia was uh, a close second, and Norway was a close third. But almost all the other countries in the world didn't have this problem. So what does that mean if all of a sudden you've got to spend all that money? Well, what that means is that people aren't going to be able to pay that money. And medical bills are the biggest cause of U.S. bankruptcies because people can't meet their medical bills and so their only, their only rational way of dealing with it is to declare bankruptcy. Now that doesn't help anybody because not only do the medical folks not get paid close to what they were, what they were owed, but also all the other creditors that that individual has that don't get paid either. So, the Affordable Care Act. Anybody know that by any other name? What's it called? Obamacare. Obamacare. <coughs> now, is that a four-letter word here? Or does anybody have an opinion on it? It's amazing how, how this has changed what we do and how we do it. We're trying to get into the next generation of healthcare in the United States. Up till now, you go and see the doctor, and the doctor has a sheet that checks, he or she checks off what he or she has done during that visit. They hand you that, you go out to the front desk, and what happens? Okay, well your insurance is gonna pay all the $30 of this. So I need you to pay me $30. Well, I gotta tell you, I was just at my internist office the other day, they actually make you swipe your credit card before you even see the doctor now. So they're sure they get paid. Because it's hard for people to get paid. It's hard for providers to get paid. Trust me, pediatricians get paid last. <coughs> and one of the things that you gotta deal with is you still gotta pay your, your people, you still gotta pay your office staff, you still gotta pay for supplies. You got all these costs that you have to that you have to pay for. And if you're not getting paid, it's like any other business, you can't stay in business. So in essence, what has happened now is that we've gotten a lot more efficient at collecting those extra amounts. However, what's also happening now is we're seeing more and more insurance plans that are covering less and less. We have this thing called value-based purchasing. Now, when you anybody bought a car lately? Who's bought a Ferrari? Come on, raise your hand. We know you're here. Nobody bought a Ferrari? Okay. Anybody bought any other car? Yeah. So when you went out to buy your car, first thing you said was, well, I want something that costs a lot of money and is really crappy. That's what I want. Crappy and low quality and high cost. That's not how we buy stuff. That's not how we buy stuff. We look for the highest quality we can get at the lowest cost. And that's what the US healthcare system is changing to now. Why is that important to you and me? Well, it's important to you and me because the way healthcare is going to be paid for in the future is different than the way it is, has been paid for in the past. You'll go to the doctor to get your blood pressure checked, to get your immunizations, to get all those things that you do to stay healthy. And you will walk out and not owe a thing. Cool. Um, I don't have to pay anything? Uh-uh. Now somebody is paying the bill and you're paying the bill. You'll be paying the bill, but you'll be paying it through the premiums that you pay for an insurance plan. But that's the way those things are going to be paid for. Now, is it just a, a pass-through for the docs and for the hospitals? No. Because we're now required to report <coughs> measures of quality. So you remember all those adverse events that I talked about that are killing people in hospitals? 
there is a measure, or more than one measure, associated with every single one of those adverse events. So not only if we want to get paid that amount of money for doing those services, we have to show that we're doing it better than anybody else. Otherwise, we won't get paid as much. Now this is all happening in the background, stuff that you guys won't see, but it's stuff that's going to have a tremendous impact on how healthcare is delivered in the United States. You're going to see a lot of different ways of, of getting healthcare now. One I mentioned here is medical tourism. Anybody ever gone to another country to get a surgical procedure done? Probably not many people yet, but this is happening. And one of the places that I thought was really kind of cool, I heard about this from one of my students. <coughs> This is Health City in the Cayman Islands. Who wants to go to the Cayman Islands? Yeah, I do too, yeah, let's go there. I'm gonna have my heart surgery done in the Cayman Islands because number one, it's a cool place to go. Number two, the quality is just as good, if not better, in a lot of places in the United States. And number three, it's cheaper. And the recuperation ain't so bad either. You know, the beach is a good place to recuperate. But I took all of these statements that are in here, and you guys, as I said, will get a copy of the slides so you can read those over. All these statements come directly from their website. So they say things like top cardiac surgeons, skilled orthopedic surgeons, and dedicated healthcare professionals meeting <coughs> critical healthcare needs efficiently, cost effectively, and with deep compassion. So those kinds of things are popping up all over the place. You may even have an insurance policy You've got private insurance in the future that will send you to another country to get a, a clinical procedure, a surgical procedure, or some other clinical procedure because it's less expensive and the quality is the same, if not better. So we may be seeing more and more of medical tourism. The other thing that we see is online care providers. Show me your phone. I got a phone? You now can use this phone. How many use FaceTime? There's you know, any of the others. Yeah, everybody uses that. Most everybody. Anybody now use FaceTime? Uh, at least you guys are young. You don't use FaceTime. I'm going to show you. <laughs> But these are some of the ways now that people are communicating with physicians so that they can get medical care that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise or they would have a hard time getting otherwise. So for example, I wake up in the morning, I've got a sore throat, got a little bit of a headache, I think I feel warm. Okay, I call my doctor's office and the doctor says, yes, that's something we probably need to have you checked. We can see you, um, let's see, this is Thursday, we can see you Monday afternoon at four. How many of you work? Yeah, are you off work at four? Not usually. And so you say, oh God, that's four days away and at four o'clock in the afternoon, so I have to take up work. Probably miss work today because I don't feel good. Maybe miss work. So that's three days of work just to get my cold taken care of. Does that make sense to anybody here? If it does, I need to talk to you. We'll, we'll talk afterwards. But nowadays, what you can do is you can go to a website, hook on to a particular physician. You can even choose the physician that you want to use, put in your credit card information, and then you're face to face with a physician right away. And that physician then can say, okay, well, open your mouth, ah, you can do all kinds of stuff using just your phone. And you can then provide individuals with health advice and sometimes prescriptions that can help make them better. Is this good medicine? I'm not sure yet, because this is still relatively new. But it's not that way. We've been doing things like telemedicine for 25, 30 years now. And so we, have, we are accustomed, more and more providers, physicians, and clinicians of various kinds, are accustomed <coughs> to working with people in environments other than face-to-face. -face. People putting their stethoscope on your chest. So these kinds of methods of providing healthcare are going to become even more prevalent because it's a lot more efficient for the clinician, and it's a lot more efficient for you guys.
because you don't have to wait to get an appointment. You don't have to go and sit in an office with all those other sick people who are going to make you sicker. You can actually get the help that you need face to face on through an electronic format. So that's going to make a big change in the future in terms of how we get the health care that, we, that, that we're going to need. So we're not just changing healthcare. I had, I had the distinct pleasure of seeing your IQ operation upstairs or over at the library. It's really amazing. And the thing that's amazing to me is how much it's going to apply to the kinds of things we're going to do in healthcare in the future. We're going to be using technology to a much greater extent. Now, most people in healthcare are kind of being dragged, kicking and screaming into this thing. Because the interfaces that have been designed to help us start using the technology are not very good yet. But the interfaces for phones were very primitive just 15 years ago. So in the next few years, 10 years, we're going to see some substantial changes. And what that's going to do is a couple of things. Number one, it's going to make it easier for you guys to get care going to make it somewhat easier for providers to be able to interact with patients. And the third thing that's going to do is it's going to reduce the cost of providing care. Because we'll be able to provide care to more people. So what's happening is healthcare is not just changing. <coughs> you know, when I go home and I change my shirt, I'm changing. But we're transforming. <clears throat> because healthcare is no longer what we thought it was many, many years ago. Healthcare is something relatively and almost completely new now, actually, because physicians and clinicians and hospitals can't really survive if we try to do the same things that we've done before. So we have to find new ways of doing things. How do you make this change happen? How do you make this change happen? Well, there are a couple of things that are happening. First of all, and this is one of my favorites, is Lean Six Sigma. How many have heard of Lean Six Sigma? Okay, so a few, uh, not everybody. I'm surprised now. We're going to get down and get, get on this now. We're going to get this Lean Six Sigma stuff here. Well, Lean Six Sigma is something that's been around really for quite some time in industry. Motorola started the Six Sigma stuff back in the 80s. Uh, Toyota started the Lean stuff back in the 50s. So all of these, these two paradigms have been around for quite some time. Lean works on getting rid of what we call non-value added work. And I always like to, in medical audiences, I can always ask people, you know, do you have anything during the day that you do that really doesn't add any value to anybody else or to you? Everybody shakes their head yes. Oh yeah, there's always something that I have to do during the day that ends up not being of value to anybody. So getting rid of that non-value added work, and there are a number of ways of doing that. You can re-engineer processes and make those kinds of things go away. You can automate this, the uh, process so that those kinds of things don't need to be done. A lot of different ways of doing that, and that's what Lean is focused on. Lean is focused on efficiency. Six Sigma, on the other hand, is more is more looking is looking more at effectiveness. And what that means in a healthcare setting is we're trying to reduce error rates. You know all those errors that I mentioned back there? We're trying to reduce those, we're trying to eliminate them. And the idea of Six Sigma is eliminating them to an extent that they're so minuscule that they're, that they're really uh, inapparent. They're only, you know, we only see the incidence of errors at about a Six Sigma level, which is about three parts per million. That's not very much when you think about it, particularly when you're up around 60, 65,000 parts per million now. So reducing errors, making healthcare safer, those are the goals of Six Sigma. So Lean and Six Sigma together really balance the situation and really create the idea of performance and value. So this is going to be a little bit hard to read, I think, on the screen. But Miami Baptist Hospital is a 520-bed hospital. They had high levels of inpatient bed utilization and emergency department usage. And some of the senior managers were working with a consultant to try to use Lean Six Sigma to help solve those problems. 
So their problems were that they had in high levels of inpatient bed utilization. This is also a problem in Canada. If anybody's from Canada, you may be aware of this too. But lots of patient beds are filled. Now, for, for most hospital administrators, that's, that's really kind of a good thing because if a patient bed is filled, then I can ha I, I'm making money on that bed. If a patient bed is not filled, then I'm not making money on that bed. So I like to have my beds filled. Now the problem is that I have people coming into the emergency room all the time. I got a person with a car wreck, I got a person with pneumonia, I got a person with a heart attack, I got all these people coming into the emergency room. Well, they need to go somewhere. So I send them upstairs to the inpatient unit where there are no beds. So you can't do that. So in essence, what you gotta try to do is find a way of emptying those beds at a rate that matches the inflow from the emergency department. And that's what Miami Baptist tried to do. So they had two goals. They improved the discharge process so that people can get out of the hospital quicker and more easily without becoming dissatisfied. It's not like, listen, we're really <coughs> glad you're here. It's time for you to leave. Here, I'm gonna just wheel you here to the door. Make sure you get all your stuff. That would lead to a lot of dissatisfaction. So they had to find a way of doing it without that kind of dissatisfaction, but they also had to reduce costs while they were doing that. As they were improving the performance, the throughput, they also had to find a way of reducing costs. They could not add personnel to do that. So it was really kind of a, a difficult conundrum to be in. They had the things that they were measuring, they had quality tools that they were going to be using, and so they had to have measures so that they could look at the quality and do the measurements. They looked at the process flows, they used the flow chart, and they used that to determine where the backups were in the process. And using that flow chart, determining where the backups were by short turnaround times of those, of those steps, they then looked at how patients were satisfied with the process, and if there was a way of looking at customer satisfaction that would reflect the changes that, that, that would identify any changes in customer satisfaction based on the data that they were, the changes they were making. Now, part of Six Sigma, for those of you who know Six Sigma, you know, is domain, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. So when you're doing a Six Sigma project, it's not enough just to say, well, I think it's here, or I think it's here in the process, or I think it's over here in the process. You really need to be doing some analytics to determine exactly which part of the process, where the major issues are, and what kinds of benefits you might get from making changes at each one of those steps. So they did this analysis, and from that, they found that about 60% of their discharges occurred in the afternoon and evening shifts after about 2 p.m. And the discharge process was creating patient and family dissatisfaction. Because that wasn't an ideal time for them to go home. And it was hard to arrange things, uh, follow-up services and things like that at that hour of the day. So they revamped, they did the improve phase. And they had five different areas, five different issues. Pediatrics, triage, which is that area in the emergency department where they figure out what you might have and put you in the right place. Fast tracking, which means that they want to push you. You know, you're having a heart attack. You need to go to the floor right now. We can't have you down here in the emergency department. Time to diagnosis and time to discharge. Those were the primary metrics that they were using. And those were the things that they focused on in their improved project. They, got, they have hospitalists who are physicians who work just in the hospital. They don't have offices like other physicians do, but they work just in the hospital. They worked on these problems, and they established several different process improvements to help improve those, uh, th those different areas. So they started discharging people earlier in the day. And that led to a lot of patient satisfaction. That really helped quite a bit. But it also helped free up those beds so as they started seeing this inflow of patients in the middle of the day and beyond in the emergency department, they could handle that flow at that point. Emergency department hours worked per patient decreased, per patient visit decreased by 
because the staff was no, long, no longer had to spend a lot of time trying to figure out where in the hospital we're going to put this patient. Instead, there was a nice uh, identified process in place that an algorithm, essentially, that helped determine exactly where that patient went as soon as the clinical condition was identified. The patient le who left without treatment rates <laughs> fell from about 8%. About 8% of people who said, oh, I've been here too long, I'm leaving, I'm not going to see the doctor, I'm not going to go to the emergency, I'm not going to go through the emergency room process. So they didn't get to charge for those patients. So that's lost revenue for the hospital. That dropped from 8% to less than 1%, which of course also improved their patient satisfaction rates. So there were a number of other things that they identified as part of their improvements. And from that then, oh, I should have mentioned also the cost reductions too, they saved in one year $4.2 million, both in terms of those left without treatment patients as well as the flow of patients through the process so that they can improve their inpatient bed utilization. So that's kind of how we approach things from a tactical level. There's also a strategic level. We have to think big picture now. And one of the things that hopefully you'll come out of as undergraduates is an appreciation of systems. Anybody think of any systems that they're familiar with? All around. How about pizza? Is that a system? College of Business. College of Business is a system. That's a good point, yeah because it has a whole set of things that it has to deliver and a whole set of processes that it has to use to deliver those things. Your car is a system, right? It's got a number of subsystems. It's got a fuel subsystem, a carburation, or whatever they call it. They've got a number of subsystems that have to work together in order to be able to create the function of the system, which is not just to make you look good, but transportation. So all these things have to work together. And the idea of a system in your body is another system. You to be, for me, being able to pace around up here in yell at you guys, all my functions have to be working. Endocrine system, my brain, all the CNS things, all those have to work. Otherwise, the system as a whole doesn't function. So it's important to think of things in terms of systems. So we think of Lean Six Sigma, but it's more of a tactical approach. Lean Six Sigma is a great tactical approach, but it, it usually doesn't look at the overall system. It can be used that way, and it has been used that way, but it typically is not. So we have to think of something different. I don't know if you guys know what ISO is or PDSA, but those are other quality improvement paradigms that are used. But again, pretty much focusing on processes as opposed to looking at the overall system. Joint Commission, NCQA, we got a number of regulatory organizations and accreditation organizations that we have to report to in healthcare. These kinds of organizations provide standards, but they really don't give you much of any ability to deal with variation within those standards. You have to meet those standards every time you're not going to survive. Baldrige, the Malcolm Baldrige uh, framework, is probably our best solution. This is the ball that we call us the ball with hockey puck. We used to like the ball with hamburger, but we get the ball with hockey puck now. This is the ball with hockey puck, and this is how these things come together. This is how the system works together. We have leadership, a subsystem for leadership. We have a subsystem for strategy, for developing strategy. We have a subsystem for customers. We integrate all of these things with workforce, operations, and hopefully leading to results. And you'll notice the other thing here is measurement, analysis, and knowledge management. So we're continually looking at how we can improve the, the distribution of knowledge throughout the organization. But also, we try to make sure that the information resources are necessary there as well. These are some of the organizations that have actually received the healthcare the Ballers Healthcare Award. Actually, these are all of the organizations, all 20 of them. Um, and I've got stories about all of them that I'm not going to go into, but a couple of them that I wanted to point out. North Mississippi. 
Anybody been to Mississippi? Anybody been to Mississippi? You want to go back to Mississippi? <laughs> Mississippi is a tough place to live, and particularly if you need health care. And North Mississippi, around Tupelo, is a really, really rough area to have access to health care because a lot of it's rural. Very little capable, or very little uh, access to primary care physicians. So the North Mississippi Health System, which first of all started as the North Mississippi Hospital, and they actually, they actually received the award in 2006. But the health system has an integrated network that spreads across all of North Mississippi even a little bit into Tennessee, but mostly in North Mississippi. So they essentially have developed a system of care where people have access, and they have access to some of the most sophisticated modalities of health care in the United States, all in a very rural, very poor area that otherwise would be horribly underserved. And that's why they actually received it, for several other reasons, but that's one of the reasons they received the ball with St. David's Hospital in Austin, Texas. Anybody been to Texas? Want to go back to Texas? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Some people do. Some people do. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> but St. David's is kind of a unique organization. Anybody heard of HCA? You better hear about HCA because that, that's where you might get a job. But HCA partnered with a local hospital in, uh, in uh, Texas, in uh, Austin, Texas, and they have a public-private partnership. HCA is a public company. This organization was running the hospital as a private organization. It's a uh, 501c3 or uh, charitable organization. And they essentially have combined the public, the, the charitable, and the for-profit organizations so that they're effective, uh, they provide care effectively in that area. Now, for-profit organizations have a real hard time with things like charity care. Those patients that show up in your emergency room and don't have any kind of coverage, any kind of insurance, or any money to pay. So they can still do that, while at the same time, they're optimizing the profitability of the system. So we've got those two tools. We've got Lean Six Sigma. We've got the Baldrige Framework. That's how we can actually accomplish these goals in healthcare now. So, it's up to you guys. It's really going to be up to you in terms of where we go with this system in the future. We're making some progress, but we've got a long way to go. So I'm more than happy to hear any questions that you might have. All right, I'm a pediatrician. What can I say? You're stuck with fiction. Any questions or thoughts? I have one here. Um, uh, where are the highest growth areas in healthcare for jobs that new graduates from the College of Business can attain? For example, IT management and so on. Yes, those are the ones, uh, IT and management. For business college graduates, probably the biggest area that you can have, that you can get a job and make a major contribution is in IT. Because it's automation that is really sweeping through the industry. And not just automation from the standpoint of health, health records which is the big thing right now, but even more importantly in terms of applying technology to providing care. Remember that picture of that lady on the phone with her doctor, or doing FaceTime with her doctor? That's the kind of technology that we're going to see more and more of in the future. Anybody got a Fitbit? Yeah, a lot of folks have Fitbits. Yeah, you can show me your Fitbit. Hey, show me your Fitbit. But Nowadays, we kind of think of those as, yeah, that's my wellness, that's my fitness thing. But in the future, those are going to be the ways that your health is going to be monitored on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute basis. Yeah. So those kinds of modalities are out there, they're being used now, and they're going to become even more important. So IT is probably the biggest area. The second biggest area, at least in my opinion, is probably going to be in terms of revenue management, financial management. because. We are going to be challenged like never before in, in healthcare systems in terms of the money we're not going to have. We're going to be, our, the funding that we have is going to be cut in a number of ways. And so being able to strategically look at and use those funds is going to be important. 
And then to me, the third big area, quality improvement. You know, to me, that's really what we're all about in healthcare. And that's one reason I used to do utilization management for health plan. I hated that. Because that was <clears throat> looking at the way people were treating people in hospitals and things like that. Trying to second guess them and figure out how we can cut costs. We have to think about ways of cutting costs, but the first thing we need to think about, I think it's incumbent upon us as healthcare professionals and also as business professionals who are in the healthcare system, is what are we doing for those people who need the care? How are we going to make sure that we provide the care for those people in a way that is cost effective as well as being highly efficient and effective? So to me, that's the quality of care. So for any of our students who are interested in that, do you see that on the internet? Absolutely. The, yeah. the question was with regard to business intelligence and how it's going to relate to healthcare. If anything, healthcare needs more than anything else, it's intelligence. So we'll always look for ways of getting more intelligence. And business intelligence is one of the ways that we can look at the system. Because all of a sudden, instead of having these little samples of data from things that people actually, from billing data that is not very good, we're going to have actual clinical data with these huge data sets. Being able to make sense of that is going to be extremely important. So business intelligence, I think, is one of the key areas where that's going to happen. Okay. For those of you who are in business intelligence, just remember my name. When you get up there at the top, just remember us four people on the way up. Please join me in thanking Dr. Leiter.